Well, welcome everyone to this webinar um, and thank you for joining us. I am a professor, Assistant Professor Diana Leong in the Department of English and Comparative Literature. Um, and I am very pleased to introduce um, my friend and mentor, Dr. Frank B. Wilderson. Um, just a couple of notes about um, the particulars of the, of the talk today. We have locked the chat. Um, we will open it again um, at the end of Dr. Wilderson's presentation, um, where we'll, we'll, we will take uh, questions um, from all of you uh, for Dr. Wilderson, and I will be moderating that as well. Um, the um, recording for this talk will also be available through the department's social media sites. Um, I believe, do we have a YouTube page? <laughs> yes, the department's YouTube page will be posted to the YouTube page um, after uh, the event is done. So uh, Dr. Frank B. Wilderson is a Chancellor's Professor of African American Studies and Drama at UC Irvine and is a founding member of the Culture and Theory Doctoral Program. Yay, Culture and Theory. <laughs> During the apartheid era, he spent five and a half years in South Africa, where he was one of two Americans to hold elected office in the African National Congress and was a cadre in the underground. His books include Incognito, A Memoir of Exile and Apartheid, which was the winner of the American Book Award, the Zora Neale Hurston and Richard Wright Legacy Award, and a National Endowment for the Arts Literature Fellowship, Red, White, and Black, Cinema and the Structure of U.S. Antagonisms, and his most recent memoir, Afro-Pessimism, which was longlisted for the National Book Award. So it's always challenging to adequately describe the scope, scale, and significance of someone's work, but that task is made even more challenging when that person is not only one of the world's leading scholars of Black studies, but also an award-winning creative writer. So, Rather than trying to sort of attempt to give a what can only really be a superficial introduction to the impact of uh, Dr. Wilderson's work, I'm going to leave you with a rather embarrassing anecdote <laughs> from my very first time attempting to teach Dr. Wilderson's work as a faculty member. So we had just finished reading excerpts of Red, White, and Black. Um, we were moving on to member uh, Incognito. This is my first year as a faculty member. And I had a student ask me to describe what I took away um, from Dr. Wilson's writing. And so being put on the spot, I had to sort of come up with something on the fly. And I replied that Dr. Wilson's work provided the catalyst for a kind of reorientation within our current political paradigm that can only be achieved through a disorientation and that it generated new understandings of the value of value itself and in particular of how a re-evaluation of our political and personal ethics is never only or simply a devaluation. So I said several things like this, and at the end of my discussion or the end of my sort of presentation, I had a student raise their hand in the back and said, okay, I totally get it now. So what you're saying is Dr. Wilderson's work is like one of those 3D eye magic paintings where you have to cross your eyes and hold it up real close to you and then back away to see the dolphins, but you're so dizzy that you don't care that they're dolphins and everything else in the world looks like bad dolphins. I'm not quite sure where my description of Dr. Wilderson's work um, fell short. <laughs> But it also wasn't necessarily a bad description of what it feels like to encounter Dr. Wilson's work, because it is, again, a kind of or reorientation that comes through disorientation and one that really sort of shakes loose the value and attachments we've had to previous ways of understanding the world, of race, of politics, really, of thought itself. Um, but this is also to say that what this incident demonstrates is that the best way to encounter or to capture or to understand the impact of Dr. Wilson's work is through Dr. Wilderson himself. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Frank B. Wilderson III. Well, thank you, Diana. And I hope you and I and everybody else can go back to first names now. It's a little queasy. This is like the first time I've heard you use doctor in like three, three times since we've known each other. Um, I just want to say back at you for everything that you've said. Um, about me today, uh, I, you and um, some of your cohort colleagues, you know, back in 2010 and what you were demanding of us in terms of the core curriculum at uh, UC Irvine, uh, we listened to and we made really radical changes, especially to the um, methodology courses for graduate students. I'm sorry that, that you weren't there to partake in this, but, but we've you and, and the people around you really changed the program in culture and theory to be what it is today and contributing to why U.S. News and World Report 
says that UC Irvine is the number one place for critical theory um, in the in the world. And so I want to thank you uh, because I learned a lot uh, being your chair from you. And I, I was thinking about that. And I and I found this. Um, in my files, it goes back a number of years, which was a, a, a letter of recommendation for a job for you. So I'll, I'll just uh, read a little bit of it um, about your project, because it's very important. I said in this letter, as I understand it, your project is an interrogation, your dissertation, of the, intel of the ideological underpinnings of the political intellectual discourse of e ecology, through which she seeks not only to enable a move from env environmentalism to what she calls a properly ecological politics, but also to demonstrate how the problematic image of nature that structures even many radical approaches to the environment is bound up with the history and logic of racial slavery. And so I would say that categorically, that is your, your dissertation is probably the very first Afro-pessimist intervention critique slash of the uh, ecology movement and its, and its discourse. And I know I learned a tremendous amount from you as you were uh, working on this. And so my hat's off to you and thank you very much. Um, you, San Diego State University, so actually has two people um, who I go back with a ways in the, in the trenches. The other is uh, Professor uh, Roberto Hernandez, who uh, I was in the, uh, Third World Liberation Front, uh, some would call it riots, other would call it agitation, some would call it demonstrations. <laughs> it really just depends upon what side of the ledger that you're on. Uh, my goodness, that was 21 years ago. And um, so a shout out to Roberto. And this is a segue into um, a rather disturbing email that uh, he sent me a couple of days ago. And I just want to read part of it to, uh, because what's interesting about this email is um, the way in which um, it raises an, an issue in a, in a kind of different way than I'm going to talk about today of the talk that I had prepared. So I'll, I'll say, I'll just read it. I, hello, Frank. I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to you because I saw you will be speaking on our campus later this week. and. Last week, San Diego State University announced a partnership with uh, the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, which has a hor horrific record of repression of social justice movements, and as you might imagine, a particularly chilling record around censorship of Palestine. More recently, when NFL player Reggie Bush publicly connected the struggle of Black communities in Ferguson with the struggle of Palestinians, the ADL slammed Bush condescendingly stating that Reggie Bush demonstrates a severe lack of understanding of both issues. He should stick to football, end quote. In any case, my colleague uh, Amira Jarmakani and myself, along with others on campus, are organizing to push back on this partnership. And without wanting to impose, we would like to ask if you might consider briefly addressing the issue on the occasion of your talk, even just briefly, so that SDSU takes note that others are concerned about this troubling partnership. And, I certainly share um, a pro-Palestinian uh, political agenda, and so I more than uh, feel it my, my obligation, not just happy to make this statement. Um, and back in the day when I was uh, TAing at uh, Berkeley, I remember that there was a young uh, student who was American, but he had a dual citizenship in Israel and had been in the uh, Israeli Defense Force. And as I was teaching uh, Fanon's uh, Black Skin, White Mask, sorry, not Fanon's Black Skin, I was teaching Wretched of the Earth, and he was in this class, um, he made the statement that he felt that a, a real affinity for Fanon because um, he felt that Israelis were the wretch of the earth with respect to the Israeli uh, situation in Palestine. I thought that was rather curious, and I thought it was my duty to, uh, well, in the humanities, you can read anything and, and make your own interpretation of it, but that was a rather bizarre interpretation, given the fact that Josie Fanon, Fanon's wife, uh, who was a white French communist, uh, actually took Jean-Paul Sartre's introduction out of the Wretched of the Earth 
uh, after 1967 when Sartre uh, celebrated the victory, the Israeli victory of, of the Six Day War. My point is that um, what should have been a kind of open ended exchange between uh, me and a student, um, su my suggesting that perhaps Fanon and certainly his wife, um, Josie, would have seen the Israelis as colonizers, not as um, natives. Uh, that led to him reporting me um, to a Hillel house and me getting on what people call a, a, a blacklist, I would call a whitelist or just a uh, bad professor list. Um, so I, I see how insidious this, this process is and how difficult uh, speaking up on these issues are. And so my hat is off to uh, this coalition. On the other hand, uh, what I have to say, though, what I've just said is important at the level of politics. But I'm going to make another intervention, which was interesting that uh, this email would come from Roberto uh, at the time that I was planning this presentation, because this is a presentation that is probably going to upset some of this or distend the calculus of what I just said at the level of what's essential ontologically. So without further ado, uh, let me get into it, and then we'll have enough time for um, comments and questions and um, uh, perhaps, as always is the case, controversial pushback. As uh, the brother said in the, the Ivan Dixon movie, uh, nothing but a man can't live without trouble, right? <laughs> So this is, a, this is an excerpt from uh, my latest book, uh, Afro-Pessimism. It is uh, 1988. The city is uh, Minneapolis, as, which is, I, I used to say that Minneapolis is not uh, the end of the world, but you can certainly see it from there. Uh, uh, but uh, now Minneapolis is all in the news for nefarious reasons. And uh, it's 1988. I am, uh, what am I? I'm 32 years old. I'm uh, working as a security guard at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and my best friend there is a Palestinian from uh, Ramallah. A high grassy knoll abutted the building that housed the Walker Art Center. The knoll is gone now, scalped clean as a root canal to make room for a restaurant. But when it was still a hill, Samir, my friend from Ramallah, and I would take our lunch there. In springtime, when the cold broke and the sky cleared, the hilltop commanded a sweeping view of white swans tracing Loring Park Lake. Distant cars in downtown streets sparkled like sequins in the sun, and from that knoll you could see the Basilica of St. Mary, of St. Mary's copper, the Basilica of St. Mary's copper dome corroded by melted snow and driving rain to a blue-green brilliance that made me think ruin was the only true object of love. The knoll was also a vantage point from which death in the making could be seen. Just below it was the bottleneck, the name of an intersection where three streets converged into one, a place where some of the most horrifying collisions occurred. As a, as a between reading spy novels, I used to imagine the bottleneck as a stretch of German autobahn where John Le Carre's ill-fated spy, Alec Liamis, saw two young children waving cheerfully from the window of a small car, and the next moment saw it smash between two large lorries. The hill was where Samir told me about his cousin who was killed in Rabala, blown up while making a bomb. But he was but he wasn't a suicide bomber. It was an accident. Samir blamed himself the way that survivors often do, no matter how near or far in space and time they are from their dead. He survived by being here and not there. My friend spoke openly as we watched the world below us rush by without even looking up to pay its respects. At one point, Samir spoke of being stopped and searched at Israeli checkpoints. He spoke in a manner that seemed not to require my presence. I hadn't seen this level of concentration and detachment in him before. That was fine. He was grieving. The shameful and humiliating ways the soldiers run their hands up and down your body, he said. <laughs> then he added, but the shame and humiliation runs even deeper is if the Israeli soldier is an Ethiopian Jew. 
the earth gave way. The thought that my place in the unconscious of Palestinians fighting for their freedom was the, was the same dishonorable place I occupied in the minds of whites in America and Israel chilled me. I, I gathered enough wits about me to tell him that his feelings were odd seeing how Palestinians were at war with Israelis and white Israelis at that. How was it that people who stole his land and slaughtered his relatives were somehow less of a threat in his imagination than black Jews, often, who are often implements of Israeli madness, who sometimes do their dirty work? What, I wondered silently, was it about black people, about me, that made us so fungible we could be tossed like salad in the minds of oppressors and oppressed? I was faced with the realization that in the collective unconscious, Palestinian insurgents have more in common with the Israeli state and civil society than they do with black people. What they share is a largely unconscious consensus that blackness is a locus of abjection to be instrumentalized at whim, on a whim. At one point, blackness is a disfigured and disfiguring phobic phenomenon. At another point, blackness is a sentiment a sentient, sentient implement to be joyously deployed for reasons and agendas that have little to do with Black liberation. There I sat, yearning in solidarity with my Palestinian friends, yearning for the full restoration of Palestinian sovereignty, mourning in solidarity with my friends, mourning over the loss of his insurgent cousin, yearning, that is, for the historical and political redemption of what I thought was a violated commons to which we both belonged. When all of a sudden my friend reached down into the unconscious of his people and slapped me upside the head with a wet gym shoe. The startling realization that not only was I banned ab initio from the denouement of historical and political redemption, but that the borders of redemption are police by whites and non-whites alike, even as they kill each other. So fast forward a year later, um, I found myself uh, no longer in Minneapolis, um, no longer working, uh, minimal wage, wage, wages at the Walker Arts Center, but as a graduate student doing a master's in fine arts and fiction at Columbia University, where I had the opportunity uh, to be one of 25 people selected to be a, in a year-long class, which was a cultural studies project that Edward Said and um, Jean Franco taught. And so now the year is 89, 90, and I'm in New York City. George Bush the first, the father, has just started the, in January 1990. Actually, started in in September of, uh, September of 90, the um, the Gulf War. New York. I took the A train from Greenwich Village to 168th and Broadway. My stop in Washington Heights. I was formally enrolled in the MFA fiction writing program at Columbia, but I was also taking night classes in fiction writing from Margaret Young at the New School for Social, Social Research. I see some people have a book there, so I'm, turning, I'm on page 232. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, I jumped from page like 15 or something to 232. I know it's, it's uh, you, you do not want me to read all 300 pages of this. Okay, so I'm selecting passages, I, I guarantee you. <laughs> all right. Um, um, so I'm taking classes at, in the daytime from Columbia and at night in Stream of Consciousness from Margaret Young at the New School for Social Research. She taught stream of consciousness writing. It washed the minimalist taste of Columbia's daytime fiction writing workshop from my mouth. As I read her hypnotic novel, Miss McIntosh, My Darling, it pulled me into the sway of the train and swathed its rock and tumble in the clatter of the rails in velvet. The glare of the subway car's carriage lights dimmed in my mind's eye. 
No longer was I in New York, nor was I underground in a train tunnel, but on a night road in rural Indiana that laced through cornfields and oceans of wheat. And there was a sleeping couple, a pair of lovers, a boy and a girl, the only other passengers. They had gotten on at a, at a dust-colored pottery town. I watched them as they tried to sleep through languorous, creaking miles of too familiar landscape. A farm boy fleeing with his strawberry-faced girlfriend who was pregnant and slumbered on his shoulder. The bus driver was whistling, perhaps in anticipation of his wife. It wasn't the bus driver, nor was it a whistle. It was a voice on the speakers above the handrails announcing 42nd Street, Port Authority stop. I hadn't noticed any subway stops between Washington Square and 42nd Street. Mind the closing doors, came next. I kept reading, but was distracted by the rush of legs that jostled toward the exit. This annoyed me. 42nd Street wasn't my stop, and these people had broken my spell. A pair of faded brown pants stopped in front of me. They were corduroy. A smirk itched in the corners of my mouth. Who wears corduroys anymore, I thought, and in this heat? Then one leg rose, and as it rose, a voice yelled, Jer, come on, from somewhere near the closing doors. The leg and the shoe that, that it held snapped out like the low half of a whip. My book dropped out of my hands. I felt my head snap, back, snap backwards. I was so dazed I didn't see the corduroys dash away. Like an echo, I heard what had come with the kick. Fucking towel head. Jerry was gone, but his voice still splintered the air. Fucking towel head. Pelham Bay in the Bronx or Bensonhurst, Brooklyn was where I felt the voices of both Jerry and the guy at the doors were from. Watchful enclaves where porcelain faces and hair black as stone nodded and hate trespassers. I was fine. No broken teeth no torn skin, but the man beside me was bleeding. A turban, not a towel, was wrapped around his head. He didn't want help from anyone around him. I asked him again if he wanted a doctor or even the transit police. The next stop was 50th. He got off there, though I'm sure it wasn't his stop. Our pity was more than he could bear. As the platform where he stood, wiping his mouth, glided past our window and the tunnel darkened around us, I thought, he's a Sikh, not an Iraqi, a Sikh, Jerry, as if accuracy in racism was the issue here. When his bleeding face faded, when the screech of iron wheels grinding to a halt at 42nd Street faded as well, I still saw that shoe snapped up and out from corduroy cuffs and the cry, fucking towel head, still peeled in my brain. I carried the Sikh's face with me for days. By now it was early winter, January 1991. The first war in Iraq was underway. By September of the previous year, George Herbert Walker Bush had deployed half a million troops to Kuwait to drive Saddam Hussein from that country, despite the fact that Bush's ambassador told Saddam Hussein in the summer of 1990 that the United States would look the other way if such an invasion took place. The day after the incident on the A train, I sat in Professor Edward Said and Jean Franco's cultural studies project class at Columbia. Said and Franco had chosen 25 students from an applicant pool of 100. I was a novice at critical theory and not for one moment did I believe I would be admitted. When I was told that the list of 100 would had gone down to 50 people who would be asked for a writing sample and a personal interview with Franco and Said, I thought, in my Minnesota way that the register had made a mistake. Edward Said was tall, urbane, and handsome, a concert pianist who after the Nakba was sent to boarding school where he met Omar Sharif, whom he called a head boy and a bully. Until I met Said, I hadn't met a professor who took the stakes of his, of his profession as seriously, even though I was surrounded by academics as a child. Later, I understood that this was not some sort of shortcoming on the part of my parents or the black scholars who were their friends. If their scholarship had been 
as open about its implications for black liberation as Edward Said's was about the implications for revolution in Palestine, they would have been killed long before they had time to raise me. Edward Said was a public intellectual and the founder of the academic field of post-colonial post -colonial, post -colonial studies. He came to class in what were surely $300 to $500 suits an even grand if, in addition to his tailored tweeds and handsome mate and handmade shirts, one considered the blend the blended wool trench coats he wore in winter. He was a controversial member of the Palestinian National Council, the legislative body of the PLO, because he publicly criticized Israel and Arab countries, especially the political and cultural policies of Muslim regimes that acted against the national interests of their peoples. And because at least in class and during office hours, if not on every public stage in, on which he appeared, he was steadfast in his conviction that the state of Israel had no place in an ethical world. First Martin Luther King, then the Black Panthers, then Frantz Fanon, then the literature of Tony K. Bambara and Toni Morrison had tutored me. Edward Said and his aphorisms came after all of that. He was far more important in my life than I was in his. When I met Said, I was the age of 33. I was primed intellectually for a great, great leap forward. And in the two short years that I knew him, my ability to explain relations of power did just that. It grew by leaps and bounds. The Palestinian National Council had been run out of Lebanon by the Israeli Defense Force. They set up shop in Tunis. After one of Said's trips to Tunis, I dropped by during office hours and told him of rumors I'd heard that he was on a hit list. This was nothing new to him. US, US Zionists, he said, threatened to kill him all the time. But this was Abu Nidal's hit list. Abu Nidal, in addition to being the commander of the Front for the Liberation of Palestine, was also a fellow parliamentarian on the Palestinian National Council, the government in exile. I sat at the end of the student queue outside Said's office, and when it was my turn, tried tricks Scheherazade would have envied to make the time with him last. I told Said that I'd heard he and, the, and Nidal had argued in Tunis about whether or not the PLO's armed wing should target civilians. Said told Nidal that the PLO should not resort to bombing buses and killing people who were not conscripted by the Israeli Defense Force or police. Nidal was reported to have mocked Said's expensive threads in the safety of his life in New York and to have reminded Said how difficult it was for an under-resourced guerrilla organization like the Front for the Liberation of Palestine to get next to targets of a military nature. And finally, to have reminded Said that the Israelis don't engage in this kind of hand-wringing when the lives of Palestinian civilians hang in the balance. The argument ended with my professor being added to Abu Nidal's list of targets. It was late in the day and the corridors of Philosophy Hall were silent, even not even the echo of dust. I was fortunate to have been the last student outside his office behind a long haired taciturn music theory candidate who went, on, who went in before me to discuss his dissertation on tonal harmony in light of Adorno's critique of tonality as an automatic system from which one must escape, but from which nobody can escape. That student was gone now, and there's, there were no more students in the horridor, ho, corridor queue. It did not occur to me that Edward Said had a wife and children that he might want to get home to. And since he didn't throw me out after the customary 10 to 15 minutes, I stayed. I can't say with any certainty that he confirmed the story about his row with Abu Nidal. Whether it was true at all, or if the details amassed like a snowball rolling downhill as it moved among the graduate students, he never let on. He smiled obliquely as I spoke. With his elbows on his desk, where dust-flecked light fell on unmarked papers, he steepled his fingers and touched them to his lips. Then he said, Abu Nidal and I are not friends, but the fact that, we might want, that he might want to kill me does not make us antagonists. 
Edward Said placed his palms on his desk. He told me that unlike him and Abu Nidal, he and Yasser Arafat were, in fact, friends. That they sat together and talked long hours and ate cornflakes drenched in orange juice in the old days in Beirut when the Israeli Defense Force laid siege to the city and cut off its supply of milk. They were lifelong friends, he and Yasser Arafat, but they were also political antagonists. Said said, Nidal and I do not have a substantive political disagreement, although, he added with a chuckle, my death at his hands would be substantive, substantive from my perspective. On the other hand, Arafat and I have a substantive disagreement. Nidal and I want the same thing, the dismantling of the state of Israel, not just a two-state solution, although that might have to be the first step. And in its place, we want the establishment of a secular, economically ethical nation, neither a caliphate nor a Jewish state, but a country where ethnic identity and religion play no part in the distribution of wealth and political capital. Nidal and I share a strategic orientation. We both have what's known as strategic rigidity. Said stressed the importance of knowing the difference between strategy and tactics. His view was that, yes, armed struggle was necessary in order to bring the, the Israeli state to an end. No nation, he said, has fallen by plebiscite. But killing civilians at this point in the struggle was tactically ill-advised and would hurt his efforts in the West. While he, Edward Said, was tactically engaged in counter-hegemonic struggles, appearances on liberal news programs, speaking at mass teach-ins on university campuses, lobbying US politicians, submitting editorials to New York Times. In other words, while he, Edward Said, was in the West engaging in a Gramsci war of position to win the hearts and minds of liberals, it would be counterproductive to the Palestinian cause if Abu Nidal was bombing school buses. What Said said was this, what exists, Frank, is a fierce disagreement, granted, but not one which is of political, which is to say strategic significance. It's a heated debate about tactics between me and Nidal. He brought Yasser Arafat back into the conversation. Arafat, on the other hand, Saeed declared, didn't know the meaning of strategic rigidity. In other words, Arafat didn't have a vision of what absolute Palestinian liberation meant. And so he would be satisfied with a squatter camp on the border of Israel as long as we have our own flag. Nidal and Saeed, Saeed told me, were tactically flexible and strategically rigid. Arafat, in stark contrast to Nidal and Saeed, was, strate was strategically flexible and tactically flexible as well. What this said to me as a young 33-year-old was that their violent disagreement notwithstanding, Said and Nidal were revolutionaries, whereas Arafat was at the end of the day a bourgeois reformer. I was learning something about the precise nature of language in the service of critical theory and revolutionary praxis. I had always used antagonism colloquially but I hadn't known that I was doing so. Therefore, it never occurred to me that just because an interlocutor wanted to kill you, it did not mean that your relationship with that person was antagonistic. The lesson I learned it at dusk in Edward Said's office would see me through harrowing moments of internecine violence months later when I finished my MFA at Columbia and left New York and moved to South Africa and joined the African National Congress. A desire for the complete dismantling of a paradigm. That was the essence of strategic rigidity. Desire into discourse, discourse into praxis. Tactical flexibility was the awareness that there was more than one way to skin a cat, but there was only one cat, not two or three. The cat was the understanding that revolution cannot be reconciled with reform. Again, the idea of strategic rigidity was not Said's original thought. Said was a student of, Edward, of, of Fanon's works, and we read Fanon's Wretch of the Earth in Said's class. Early on in that book, Fanon provides the sinews of strategic rigidity when he writes, and I quote at length here, to break the colonial world does not mean that after the frontiers have been abolished, lines of communication will be set up between two zones. The destruction of the colonial world is more 
is no more and no less than the abolition of one zone, its burial in the depths of the earth or its expulsion from the country. As far as the native is concerned, morality is very concrete. It is to silence the settler's defiance, to break his flaunting violence, in a word, to put him out of the picture." End quote. On this passage from Fanon, Said and Nidal would agree, this passage from Fanon is the cat, but how to skin the cat? That's where, we fell, that's where they fell out. Arafat, I was learning from Said via, via Fanon, was a reformer. The fact that Arafat engaged in armed struggle did not change his political orientation. He was no revolutionary because unlike Said and Nidal, Yasser Arafat had accepted the existence and the legitimacy of the state of Israel. Edward Said and Abu Nidal were neither violent nor nonviolent, meaning neither man elevated tactics to the level of principles in the way that Gandhi did. The phenomenon of black skin white, white mass, however, differs from the phenomenon of the wretch of the earth on the question of violence. It is my steadfast conviction that this difference should be thrown into relief in, in, in order to understand how the black, the slave, suffers in ways that cannot be reconciled with the suffering of oppressed humans, such as the post-colonial subject. The France phenomenon of the wretch of the earth makes two points concerning violence. The first point, is that violence is the precondition for thought, meaning that without violence, the regiming episteme and its elaborated social structures cannot be called into question paradigmatically. Without revolutionary violence, politics is always predicated on the ensemble of existing questions, and these questions are in service to reformists, not revolutionary projects. The second point is that this absolute or in an Afro-pessimist vernacular, we might say gratuitous violence is not so absolute or gratuitous after all. Not, that is, in Fanon's Algeria or in Edward Said's Palestine. It comes from a, it comes, this violence in Algeria and Palestine comes with a therapeutic grounding wire, a purpose that can be articulated, the restoration of the native's land is that purpose. One can read Fanon's second gesture in The Wretched of the Earth as either an alibi for or a concession towards his hosts, the Algerians, but it doesn't matter which one it is. What matters is that there is an irreconcilable difference between the violence that positions and is performed upon the slave in social death and the violence that positions and is, is imposed upon the non-Black native in civil societies. The vulnerability of the native is open, but not absolute. Materially speaking, the native carves out zones of respite by putting the settler out of the picture whether back to, Europe, back to the European zone or into the sea. But there is no analogy between the native's guarantee of restoration predicated on her need to put the settler out of the picture. What I mean is there's no analogy between the France Fanon in this passage, the wretch of the earth, and the slave's guarantee of restoration predicated on her need to put the human out of the picture, which is the Fanon of black skin white mass. By way of contrast, the Fanon of Black Skin White Mass hits upon, but is never quite comfortable with, the idea that the violence Black people face is a violence of a parallel universe. In short, Black people and non-Black people do not exist in the same universe or paradigm of violence any more than fish and birds exist in the same region of the world. It is not the violence of economic exploitation and alienation, although most Black people are members of the working class and they suffer at some important level, economic exploitation as a result of alienation from what is presumptively their labor power. That is true. I say presumptively because Black labor is not the possession of Black people any more than we possess our bodies. Nor are we dispossessed of land like the Irish or the Native Americans or Edward Said and Nidal's Palestinians. 
notwithstanding the fact that save Ethiopia, all black Africa, all of black Africa has been colonized at one point or another. The antagonist of the worker is the capitalist. The antagonist of the native is the settler, but the antagonist of the black is the human being. I could not explain all this when I knew Saeed, but I felt it, this rejoinder, like an unscratched itch. In my friendship and solidarity with Samir, another Palestinian at the Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, had, suffered, had surrendered to the force of his unconscious when grieving the death of his cousin in Ramallah. He said, the shameful and humiliating way the soldiers run their hands up and down your body. Then he said, but the shame and humiliation runs even deeper if the Israeli soldier is an Ethiopian Jew. The itch had become a spike wound in my body, so much so that as the years passed by, I saw more dissonances than, reson than resonances between Samir and Saeed's Front for the Liberation of Palestine and the Black Liberation Army. On October 22nd, 1972, the Black Liberation Army detonated a time release anti personnel bomb at the funeral of a San Francisco police officer. This, according to the Justice Department and the Black Liberation Army sanctioned literature, was the first of their 40 to 60 paramilitary actions la launched between 1969 and 1981. Even though nationwide, the BLA probably never numbered more than 400 insurgents working in small, often semi-connected cells. Their, arm, their armed response to the violence that enmeshes Black life was probably the most consistent and politically legible response since the slave revolts that occurred between 1800 and 1840. 20 years after the Black Liberation Army launched its first attack on the state, Toni Morrison appearing on Bill Moyer's a uh, world, uh, world of ideas, was queried about the moral ground that Setha, the protagonist of her most famous novel, stood on when she killed her child beloved in order to save that child from slavery. What right, in other words, did she have to author, to offer her child death as a sanctuary from bondage? This was the question that Bill Moyers asked Toni Morrison. What right did she have to offer her child death as a sanctuary from bondage? So herein lies the paradox of political engagement when the subject of politics is the slave. Is this, it was the right thing to do, Toni Morrison responded, but she had no right to do it. The analogy on one hand between Setha and Beloved and on the other hand between uh, insurgents from the Black Liberation Army is a structural analogy that highlights how both the BLA insurgents and Toni Morrison's characters are void of relationality. In such a void, death is a synonym for sanctuary. When death is a synonym for sanctuary, political engagement is, to say the least, a paradoxical undertaking. When I sat on that grassy knoll at the Walker Art Center with Samir Bashira, and later when I went to Columbia and met Edward Said, this paradox was something that I disavowed. At the time, I believed in the analogy between Said's and, Said, and Samir's much loved Front for Liberation of Palestine and my much loved Black Liberation Army. But when the force of Samir's unconscious confessed that being frisked and molested by Black Jews was more humiliating and of a greater threat to the psychic life of Palestinians than being frisked and molested by white Jews, my, my dream of solidarity and redemption went into free fall. It was 1988. And I was only 32 without the toolbox of critical theory needed to explain my sudden disorientation, even to myself. To be honest, my conscious mind tried to ignore the clench in my gut. It clung to a dream of global, of a global multicolored revolutionary army that would liberate us all. Internationalism was a talisman that I would not let go of. 
I would not allow my rational mind to say what my unconscious was telling me, that a new Palestinian state would be just as anti-Black as the Israeli state in the United States of America. In fact, as anti-Black as the entire world is. This was a thought that hurt so much, so it remained repressed until the turn of the 21st century when it blathered out in spittle and howls beneath the bright lights of a psych ward that I found myself in at UC Berkeley. Since the murder of Michael Brown in August of 2014 in Ferguson, it has become common for radical activists to compare Ferguson with Palestine. Comparisons such as these are based on an empirical comparison of cops killing black youth in Ferguson and Israeli Defense Force killing Palestinian youth on the West Bank and Gaza. If we use our eyes, the two phenomena have a lot in common. It stands to reason, by extension, revolutionaries in Palestine, such as the largely secular Marxist Front for the Liberation of Palestine, and revolutionaries in the US, such as the largely secular Marxist Black Liberation Army could be seen as fighting different factions of the same enemy, capitalism and colonialism in different countries. But this is not the case. Most revolutionary theorists try to show how the bond of political interests among people of color who are struggling against state domination is of primary importance. We are all anti-capitalists is the cry commonly heard, or we are all anti-colonialists, or we are all, we are all anti-sexist. But this alliance of the conscious mind fails to account for the way the unconscious mind refuses to calibrate with political interests. This is the pitfall of most leftist thinking. The Black Liberation Army's relationship to state violence is not, I repeat, not, analogous to other insurgents organizations relationship to violence. Ferguson is not Palestine. Ferguson is a threat to Palestine, a threat far greater than that of Israel's occupying army, a threat, sorry, at the heart of this structural antagonism, even between like minded revolutionaries is the difference between two irreconcilable modes of vertigo, subjective vertigo, and objective vertigo. The guerrilla war that the Black Liberation Army waged against the United States in the 60s, 70s, and early 80s was part of a multifaceted struggle to redress Black dispossession that has been waged since the first Africans landed in the so-called New World. With only small arms and crude explosives at their disposal, with little or nothing in the way of logistical support, with no liberated zone to reclaim or retreat to, and with no more than a vague knowledge that there were a few hundred er other insurgents, the Black Liberation Army launched 66 operations against the largest police state in the world. Vertigo must have seized them each time they clashed with agents of a nuclear weapons regime with 3 million troops in uniform, a regime that could put 150,000 new police on the streets in any given year, and whose ordinary white citizens frequently deputize themselves in the name of law and order. Subjective vertigo, no doubt. A dizzying sense that one was moving or spinning in an otherwise stationary world, a vertigo brought on by a clash of glossy, sorry, of grossly asymmetrical forces. There are suitable analogies. For this kind of vertigo must have seized Native Americans who launched Ames occupation of Wounded Knee and the FLA, FALN insurgents who battled the FBI in support of independence for Puerto Rico and Palestinians and the PLFP who battled the Israeli Defense Force. Throughout this book, however, I have argued that the Black is a sentient being, though not a human being. A sentient being, though not a human being. The Blacks and the humans' disparate relationship to violence is at the heart of this failure of analogy. The human suffers contingent violence, violence that kicks in when he resists or is perceived to resist the disciplinary discourse of civil society's rules and laws. But Black people's saturation by violence is a paradigmatic necessity, not simply the performance of contingency. To be constituted by and disciplined by violence, to be gripped simultaneously by subjective and objective vertigo, 
is indicative of a life that is radically different from the life of a sentient being who is constituted by discourse and discipline by violence when he breaks with the ruling discursive codes. When we begin to assess revolutionary armed struggle in this comparative context, we find that human revolutionaries, meaning workers, women, gays, lesbian, post-colonial subjects who are not black, human revolutionaries suffer subjective vertigo when they respond to the state violence with revolutionary violence, but they are spared objective vertigo. This is because the most disorienting aspects of their lives are induced by the struggles that arise from intrahuman conflicts over competing conceptual frameworks and disputed cognitive maps, such as the American Indian movement's demand for the return of Turtle Island or the Israelis' demand for the return of Israel to Palestine. But for the Black, that is for the slave, there are no cognitive maps, no conceptual frameworks of suffering and dispossession that are analogous with the myriad maps and frameworks that explain the dispossession of human subjects. So I'll conclude here with one last um, paragraph. The Israelis are killing the Palestinians, literally, but psychic life, human capacity for relations is vouchsafed by a libidinal relay between them and their common labor to avoid what Fanon calls niggerization. This relay is the generative mechanism that makes life life, a relay even between warring factions. It is also the generative mechanism of Black suffering and isolation. To paraphrase David Marriott, this kind of anti-Blackness lives inside the Black unconscious as well. The end of this generative mechanism would mean the end of the world. We would find ourselves peering into the abyss. This trajectory is too iconoclastic for working class, post-colonial, and or radical feminist conceptual frameworks. The human need to be liberated in the world is not the same as the Black need to be liberated from the world, which is why even the most radical cognitive maps draw borders between the living and the dead, between humans and Blacks. Finally, and this is most troubling, if we push this analysis to the wall, it becomes clear that eradication of the generative mechanism of Black suffering is also not in the interests of Black revolutionaries. For how can we disimbricate Black juridical and Black political desire from the Black psyche's desire to destroy the Black imago, a desire that constitutes the psyche? In short, bonding with whites and non-whites over phobic reactions to the Black imago provides even the Black psyche with the only semblance of psychic integration it is likely to have, the need to destroy a Black imago and love a white ideal. As David Marriott writes, and I quote, in these circumstances, having a white unconscious may be the only way to connect with or even contain the overwhelming and irreparable sense of loss the intruding fantasy offers the medium to connect with the lost internal object, the ego. But there is also no outside to this real fantasy, and the effects of this intrusion are irreparable." End quote. This raises the question, who is the speaking subject of Black insurgent testimonies? Who bears witness when the Black insurgent takes the stand? Who is writing this book? Thank you. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Wilderson. Um, we are going to open the chat for questions. Um, and I have no doubt that there will be many. <laughs> um, but as uh, folks are sort of um, 
collecting their thoughts, um, putting putting those thoughts to words. I have a few questions for Dr. Wilderson to sort of just get us started, um, if you wouldn't mind responding to. Um, so I wanted to ask you, if possible, um, Dr. Wilderson, um, to speak since we are a Department of English and Comparative Literature, um, and you do such an excellent job of sort of blending um, creative writing with critical work, right? Sort of um, exploding the boundaries of genre in very many ways. Um, what you think um, Afro-pessimism as both a intellectual disposition and a meta theory can bring to the study of literature um, or to literary criticism more specifically? Okay, oh, thank you. I'll, I'll share my screen to help me answer this in a way that is not too long-winded. <laughs> um, so, So, uh, Danny, you've seen this, okay? Yes. Okay. So, in a, in a nutshell, and I, I don't the question, I'm not, I'll send this to you if you want to distribute it to people. This is, you know, I, as you can see, for, right off the bat, I, I am not a visual artist. Um, this is very clear by this <laughs> by this diagram, but I, I don't get paid to be one. So, uh, basically, what you have here are um, two kind of uh, meta uh, interpretations of of a narrative arc. And at, at the top, what you have is um, the arc of, 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 a, of, of, of a bourgeois story. So that you have on, on the bottom here, uh, on the left-hand side, the, the story starts with equilibrium. Normally, normally nine out of 10 stories that you're gonna experience unless you grew up in a country like Cuba are stories about white secular families or white love or white and love, uh, individual stories of what I call moral redemption. And it starts with uh, status of equilibrium, even if you have a, a novel like um, Garcia Marquez's is 100 Years of Solitude where the actual first page is not a page of equilibrium, the actual arc of what happened starts with a, a state of equilibrium or plenitude that at the top of the arc is disturbed with the conflict stage. All right. And so then we then the story moves to the denouement, which is the bottom right hand, uh, where you have uh, what's called narrative redemption. And that narrative redemption can be uh, uh, the, re the restoration of the uh, heteronormative white family, someone finds a new mate that is better, uh, people stop kicking their dogs, they love each other, whatever. It's the restoration of a kind of moral equilibrium. And the and here's a, the, the part of, that I'm trying to get to for your question, Dan, is that the driving force of this arc is, uh, which is called the causal principle of the, of the narrative progression, is based on individual psychology and morals, individuals being good to each other and kind of psychological motivation. So people are individuated and restoration of, of, of a moral world happens in this state. Okay, so Marxist narratologists have interrogated that and said, well, this is because we're fed so many of these stories, that's precisely why we can't get a revolution off the ground in America. And people like the Gramscian uh, film th uh, theorist, uh, Mike Wayne, in his book, Theorizing Video, uh, Video Practice, uh, in, in offers to the world a different way of telling stories, where instead of an arc of moral judgment, which you have at the top, you tell a story which has an arc of ethical assessment. So that the characters in the story are primarily types, women, gays, Latinx people, black people, native people. And what is foregrounded in the storytelling is who they are in terms of institutional suffering. And so we have equilibrium at the beginning of the story and you can see at the bottom corner bottom left hand corner of this diagram a free people a free land and then you have the 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 conflict stage is disequilibrium contact with respect to columbus or native americans or the rocking up of the the pied noir in algeria or the or the colonizers in uh, israel you have something that doesn't have to happen in real life to, to have this narrative redemption, but can be imagined coherent. This is the important thing that Afro pessimism would say in why Black people cannot be narrative subjects in either, in either diagram, the top or the bottom, because both require a subject of narration, not an object of narration. And so at the bottom, you have a revolutionary story which offers a vision of a renewed equilibrium. Now, why doesn't that work? And what is the argument that we borrow from 
uh, as you know, Diana, but others might not know, from Hortense Spillers and, uh, um, and Sadia Hartman has helped me because she was my advisor on this. As opposed to a narrative arc, Blackness cannot enter into an arc of redemptive denouement because there is, it's, it's what we, is what Spurs calls the, a, a kind of flat line of, of history, right? On the left, we have a status of disequilibrium. Blackness as a paradigmatic position, this is highly controversial, which is, is an apple pessimist move, comes into being as Moroccan Jews, Arabs, Iranians, Chinese, uh, South Asian people, all from 625 AD to the time of the Portuguese, 1400, vamp on Africa. And this position, cultural identities become under an umbrella of blackness. So there's no blackness prior to slaveness, to oversimplify. Disequilibrium is the actual beginning status of blackness and full equilibrium is the middle, and this is a return to disagreement. This is what makes the fact that other people who are oppressed in the bottom part of the, of the second, uh, of, the, of the, the diagram that I put here, can have a narrative arc of institutional redemption, or white people who are not oppressed can have a narrative arc of moral redemption. The fact that redemption itself is coherent can only gain its coherence because there are sentient beings who cannot participate in a redemptive arc, that is the slave. And so this is a gloss, to answer your question, on the intervention that Afro-pessimism has had to um, narratology in general and um, literary theory in particular. So I'll, I'll stop there because I know there are more people wanting to talk. So, And I'll, and I'll in, in screen share. Thanks, Frank. Just as a warning, I think you're you're cutting out just a little bit, so I want to make sure that we don't, um, in case um, you get kicked out back down here, we lose you. That we'll come right back to the space. So, so did, it, did, did something I said? Am I here now? Are you hearing me now? Yes, you're good. Sometimes it was just a little bit. It might actually just be me. No. <laughs> okay. Um, other questions for Dr. Wilderson. You're still um, sort of letting it marinate, <laughs> his, his words marinate before chewing on them. Um, I completely understand. Um, uh, so as folks are getting themselves together again, I did have another question for you, uh, Frank, if you wouldn't mind. Um, so this is this is now your, your third major, major um, book, um, your first memoir being Incognito, which was um, published a number of years ago and then reissued again by Duke University Press and I believe it was 2015. 2014, yeah, recently. Um, so there is a, a about a, you know, at least a, a good a 10, 15 years between, more than that, between the two memoirs. And I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how the process of writing this, this uh, most recent memoir shifted um, from the process that you undertook during the first memoir and how in particular um, your views about the sort of intertwining of the personal and the political um, changed between the writing of the two memoirs. Yeah, it was it, 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 it was easier to get this book published uh, because um, the first book nobody wanted, and <laughs> you know, um, I I just thank black people in the streets setting it off for the um, foundation, the capacity for Afro pessimism to live in the world. We, it, it's it, it was it was like my, that book uh, Incognito was written uh, as I was writing my dissertation as I my dissertation in 2012 and, and 2004 2002 2004 at the same time I was writing Incognito to to capture everything I'd done in South Africa and to deal with what was going on at the time but um, there was no mass movement there was no Black Lives Matter there was no and there's nothing there was nothing this larger umbrella structure, which I'm more connected to, called the movement for Black Lives, which includes Black Lives Matters and a lot of other things. And so um, there was tremendous amount of pushback in the publishing establishment um, because it was, a, it was a book that was circulating to be sold to trade presses, whereas at the same time, my dissertation, Red, White, and Black, was circulating to university presses, which are just more able to digest radical thought. And so the problem, you know, there were there was there were so many problems. I, I I mean I just won't get into them all. I mean one was 
one publisher wanted me to um, either say that when I was a member of the underground in South Africa, I did not kill anyone, or to uh, put in that book that I was remorseful if I had. And I, I used a, about 10 different words where they all, I mean, the translation came to Anglo-Saxon words when you fuck you, uh, but they weren't the exact. <laughs> you know? And those are words that you want to say after you get your, your first advance. <laughs> <laughs> not, not before, uh, you know, it, there was just, it was just so much hell. I mean, I was, I was five minutes before this was going, 10 minutes before this was going national public radio. Uh, this person says to me, the producer says, I want to know if you killed anybody uh, before you go on the show. I was like, wait a minute. I've heard you with CIA uh, analysts and agents on this show. I've heard you with army people. When your, when your relatives come home from Afghanistan and Iraq, do you say you don't get a drumstick for Thanksgiving unless you tell me whether or not you killed somebody or not? I said, you're really, there's no such thing as a fucking American who's against violence, okay? You can't be American. You can't pay your taxes without being a mass murderer, okay? So how can you actually say that you don't believe in violence? I said, you're, 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 you're lying to yourself. You don't, you, you're, you, you just don't believe in black people killing white people. That's what you don't believe in. And I refuse to answer the question because I won't let any white person uh, judge me uh, morally, you know. I will talk to your audience about uh, structural violence. And uh, so she hung up and didn't let me on the show. Um, uh, it was, it was, that, that was just a whole nightmare to get it published. Um, then uh, white women have a lot to do with publishing, not at the managerial level, but the editorial level. And when they understood that the argument was that uh, black male musculature and aggressivity, you know, anti women uh, aggression and violence is morally wrong, but it's ethically paradoxical when the person is black because white women are always masters of black men. That was like not okay. And they didn't publish. It was, it was, you know. And finally, two two people, Jocelyn Burrell, who is now a grad student at UC Irvine in cultural theory, was a publisher at uh, Southern Press, and she said to me, uh, "This is what we've been trying to tell white women all along." And she um, bought the book and published it. That it took it took like two years of that, you know. And then the tour was was a nightmare. But you know, and here's the ugly part about it: then Trayvon Martin was killed. And, and Jared Sexton's book, Amalgamation Scheme, was out. And then, uh, you know, Mark Brown was killed and Black people arose. And then people started coming to me. Hey, you got anything? You got anything? You know, I was like, what the fuck? What about, you know, <laughs> 10 years ago? So anyway, that was, that was the difference. I also believe that I really was done with critical theory with the second book. And I wanted to just, I've got three unfinished novels, um, but First Soul Press and the New Press called me in 2017, they wanted a book of essays. And so I was fortunate to get with Bob Weil, not with either Verse or, or, or South End, who is a publisher and a, and a, a editor at South End, sorry, at, um, I should know, Liverite. And he'd published all kinds of black theorists. He, the Malcolm X book that won the National Book Award, he was the editor for that book. And he bought this book and I told him what I wanted to do. And he was, he was a literary novelist, pub editor, and a poetry editor and a creative nonfiction editor. And he was really cool with me blending these two together and we worked really, really well. So a lot more there, but I'll try to make these shorter answers. Great, thank you, Frank. Um, we have a, a couple of questions in the chat. One from um, Christina Simmons, one of our graduate students, soon to be PhD student at UCLA. Um, and asks, <laughs> does the black need to be liberated from the world on page 252 imply that the Afro pessimist black liberation is a sort of mutually assured destruction between the black and human? If this is something that is safe to say um, would most likely not occur, what does the Afro pessimist want from black liberation movements if desire can even be considered to be a factor? Ah, <laughs> I, I see you're going to grad school. Yeah, I can't, I can't, I can't do that in five minutes. It's, it's not just the heart of everything. I mean, it's just, uh, you, you can get my email and send me an email and we'll, we'll chat. It's, it's, I was doing a lot of workshops for, uh, I, I did for movement for black lives groups, like in Montreal and Toronto and and I did a big one for 35 Black Lives Matter leader in from at the Audubon Ballroom, which is now the Shabazz Center in New York. And that kind of question came up and I said, look, here's the deal. 
you cannot organize black political activity through an afro pessimist discourse hey people let's get down with the end of the world you know i mean really <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like it, you just you can't you can't you can't do that uh black people need relief and afro pessimism offers no relief you you actually the, the degree to which you have to suffer to just to just take afro pessimism into your mind and your body is a degree to which you might not recover from um so black people need better housing better food, into, into, micro, into, micro, into microaggressions, uh, into police brutality. I mean, hell, what's going on in my city of Minneapolis right now, okay? And I was saying, this is what you all do and keep doing your thing, you know? The, the beauty of where we're at now is that all over the world, there are these, there are these entities. Uh, I, I went to Vienna. I mean, I didn't even know there was a Black Movement for Black Lives Movement in Vienna and did an Afro-pessimist workshop. So the point is that, as black people clear space on what I would call a reformist agenda, and and I and I'm very very I'm so hard on reform that things that other people call uh, revolutionary I label as reformists. You know, um, any any discourse of access or rights is is reformist. I'm categorically uninterested in it. But I can I am not an organizer anymore. I you know, and I would never. It would be difficult to organize over Afro pessimism on the. On the other side, there is no relief to black suffering that can be written in a sentence. So there are two facts. There's no relief to black suffering that can be written in a sentence. It's actually the, the, the end of black suffering is the end of black people and the end of the human. We're in another epistemy to which there will be other categories. So you cannot actually, I mean, I have seen black suffering in places that I would go to war for. Cuba. I spent six weeks in Cuba. It was so disillusioning. In 1973, I spent three weeks in the Soviet Union. I mean, anti-Blackness organizes the relational dynamic of every society all around the world. It is the grain of sand that makes for reality, which means that you cannot write a sentence as to what that would look like. But you can say is that it wasn't always here when it won't always be here. But you cannot say, unlike Marx, what will be on the other side. So the beauty of Black people is that Black energy is very different than any other energy. Black energy can be so damn iconoclastic that it can move on a structure without ideas. That, and that's really tremendous. This is why so many multicultural groups like to have Black people in the mix, because they like to feed parasitically off of Black energy and then jettison Black people after they get their shit, right? So I, my hat is off to Black people who are organizing for reformist goals, like the end of better housing and the end of police brutality, and bringing in Afro-pessimism for these political education workshops and this is a very, very important revolutionary dynamic. That's uh, we'll, we can talk off camera, Christina, about more of this, but because because that's a big answer a question, really. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, it's a, it's a great question. I think it sort of goes to your point that you make in your conversation um, with with your mother at the end of Afro pessimism, where she asks about the practicality of Afro pessimism, and you say you sort of repeat, you know, well, it's it's politics of refusal, politics of refuse. To re it refuses to be affirmed and one has to sort of you know sit with that um thank you we have another question um from um sam Farzane. excuse me if i mispronounced that i am iranian american recently there was a heated discussion amongst iranians uh inside and outside of the country about a blackface character in uh, iranian folk drama the character is an illiterate servant or slave who dances on the streets for a few coins some are saying this character is racist and it should be wiped from our cities and scenes some are protesting, saying it's not racist in Iranian culture. They say Iranians should not bear the punishment for Americans and European scenes. But the US dominance on the world culture, I think slavery is not the US and European scene only. It is an international issue. It's a good question. I think it sort of goes to the idea of why people are so willing or, or so, or so driven to see Afro-pessimism as purely US-centric, your sort of take on slavery. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, well, that again. These are these great sixty-four thousand dollars questions, but they they do take weeks to answer. I mean, it's not, <laughs> so, do it in two minutes, Frank. <laughs> yeah, two minutes. All right. So here's the deal. Uh, if if this person can email me, I I may I may be able to find a recording 
of uh, my Afro pessimist grad seminar that, that we just finished with, where uh, one, one session dealt with uh, Bashu the Little Stranger, which is an Iranian film about um, a black boy from the southwestern part of Iran where the slaves were. Um, and they're typically Arabized. Uh, it's, a, it's a black African community, uh, kind of culturally, they're African and Arab. And um, it, it's a complicated film. But, but so we talked about this very question. Um, and the question solicits me on two levels. One is a level that I don't politically, but also ontologically. And it's the ontological level that I'm most interested in. And so I would say, um, Parisa Vaziri, do you remember, was she around when you were, uh, she was in, con where, yes, okay. Yes. I, Cause y'all y'all just leave us in Irvine and you come and you go. So I don't know who there, but Parisa Vaziri, uh, who I had the uh, real honor, uh, like with Diana of working with is now uh, writing a book on this very issue uh, where she's basically arguing that you really can't understand the capacity for Iranian cultural and political coherence unless you understand the germ of anti-blackness at the core of it. And she's written a very long 44 page chapter on this film, which I use in teaching. I do not have permission to send you this chapter because it's a draft form, uh, but she is now at Cornell University. And, um, and I would just um, um, reach out to her for that, that book and that chapter, reach out to me for the class where, where we discuss this. Two things can be happening at the same time. Iran can be the victim of US imperialism, which it is. And it can also be the perpetrator, the perpetrator and um, uh, the, uh, a society that, ex that fortifies and extends anti-blackness out of necessity. Those two things can happen at the same time. Thank you. And I've also put, um, oh, um, Sam, you say, you know, Frisa, but I put her contact information in the chat just in case. Um, we also have a question from, um, oh, my colleague, Roberto, uh, who asks, what would you think of folks like the Zapatistas who rather than a redemptive or restorative uh, denouement have instead spoken of the need quite literally, as you have said, to bring the world to an end? One which they identify more broadly as a, uh, as a civilization of death, uh, notwithstanding other cosmological spiritual understandings of death as sanctuary or complementary to life. Yeah, well, back in the day, Roberto and I read a lot of that literature. <laughs> yeah. So we won't tell you about our arrest records and all that. Um, so, first of all, I mean, you know, when we were organizing the Third World Liberation Front strike, uh, th this was a very important thing because uh, uh, Roberto and and this is this is this is a thing that happened with undergraduates in ethnic studies uh, who came into a um, conference that graduate students had had put forth to celebrate 30 years of the 30th anniversary of the Third World Liberation Front strike in 1969. They came up with a document that somehow they'd hacked out of computers or something. I don't know how they got it. You know, maybe I shouldn't tell it because you got a job now. Maybe after get. <laughs> You know, and uh, this document said that that Berkeley was going to shut down ethnic studies, and so we went to war over that. Um, and I was very much inspired. I was reading everything I could from some Commandante Mar Marcos uh, in that in that period, and so I I do see that as having some resonance. However, I I just so I would say that that I would like to meet. Marcos and talk with him and talk about all this and and I share at the level of discourse the sentiment of what he's saying, but I also believe that in cultural studies there's a thing called articulation, which is the the capacity for symbols that one group produces to articulate and resonate with the symbolic production of of, a, of another group, and that is still the essence of an indigenous slash white war. It's an articulation over whose uh, notion of time and space will prevail. Is this going to be called Ohlone Land or is it going to be called Watsonville? Um, and I think that that whereas the words that Roberto read from Marcos are words that I would actually articulate myself, I do not think the relational dynamic uh, uh, between the people in Chiapas and the Mexicans and the and the whiter Mexican state is the same relational dynamic between blacks in the world. 
I do not believe there's any articulation between black people struggling against others. In other words, what I believe is that the the dominating group, there, as Fanon writes it best in, in chapter five of, of Black Skin, White Mass, the black offers no ontological resistance to the other. And Indians are always present with ontological resistance, even as they're being massacred. You can read the Dred Scott decision in which he, um, Justice Taney, articulates that Indians are a low form of humanity. They can be resuscitated if we train them better. Blacks are outside of humanity. And, and that is, you know, unfortunately for us, we do not, you know, we almost got back to the 19th century with Donald Trump. Uh, uh, but in the 19th century, people actually spoke the unconscious through the preconscious. I would not have a job because I would not be able to do a symptomatic read of everything if everyone said blacks are slaves. But <laughs> so that would be my only difference. I know we're moving on, so I'll, I'll go to the next one. I think we have time for um, maybe one final question from um, Matt Fowler. I'm drawn to this idea of black revolutionaries seeking not liberation in the world, but rather liberation from the world. A viewpoint that I engage with, with engage in, I'm sorry, with other indigenous folks, and in thinking about this, I'm drawn to discussions surrounding the shortcomings of both the past and contemporary modes of anarcho radical leftist thought, wherein there is an imagined utopia that inevitably models hierarchies rather than an active nihilist view of the world where each tower must fall. And I'm wondering, would an Afro-pessimist approach find itself along a similar cognitive framework or something different? Help me out, Diana, because I'm sweating and trying to move fast. Um, can you, can you, can you do <laughs> no, a I'll condense, uh, Sure, condense that. Or if, if Matt, um, if, if you wanted to unmute yourself um, and to give us a sort of uh, pressy for the question. That'd be helpful, yeah. Is Matt around? I couldn't unmute myself. Um, put me on the spot here. Um, yeah, so um, I, yeah, like I said, like I'm really drawn to this idea of um, Black folks and Black revolutionaries wanting to not be liberated within the world, but rather liberated from the world. I think kind of what, what Roberto was kind of talking along a similar point. And I'm wondering, like, I, I see a lot a lot of the shortcomings, right? If you look at like modern like anarchist movements or like leftist movements where there's this, this the shortcoming is always this like imagined utopia, um, mm -hmm. which which models hierarchic models, you know, that, that they're attempting to destroy. Um, and I think that's just kind of the nature of, of any structure. Um, and I'm wondering if Afro -pessim pessimism is kind of, I guess it's a clarifying question, if it can kind of find itself along the same lines as like this kind of like active nihilist view of like each sort of like hierarchy must fall or each like form of, I think you kind of speak to it with like desire or like even like framework like must fall or does it find itself along kind of a different like theoretical line? What, what would be just anecdotally, what would be like the other different analytical line? Like give me just an example so I can, so I can answer this succinctly. So like, the, is it is it seeking to liberate itself, liberate itself from like all hierarchy or is it imagining something else? I think that's a, okay. A, it's a, uh, is it imagining another kind of world? Is that what you mean? Yeah, or like yeah, kind of like what what is the framework attempting to to create itself? Yeah. Okay, there is. Yeah, thank you. So I'll try to be very brief. I know we're running out of time. So whether you have postcolonial studies, uh, radical feminism, Marxism. Um, they all have different kinds of webbing, you know, but, but they are rhetorically scaffolded in the same way that they come with a descriptive gesture, which is to say, what is the nature of the problem? So radical feminism, I do not need Betty Friedan, Friedan's second, second wave feminism, which asks the question, how can women live better in the world? Radical feminism would be like Kaja Silverman, or, which is asking, how can the world where women are be destroyed so that the word woman and man doesn't exist anymore? We, on the other side, there would be a word maybe like trans, right? That's what I mean. But that So they would say, what is the problem? The problem is the family structure is mapped over by Oedipus. And Oedipus produces patriarchy, and um, a second class citizens for women. Let's destroy the nuclear family structure as it's mapped over by Oedipus and then reorganize it around something else like transness, you know, where the, so that these categories, 
woman and man no longer exist in the world. And Marx would say that's important, but but inessential. The essential thing, what organizes the world? Organizes the world's political economy. Political economy is mapped over by capitalism. So what we got to do is destroy capitalism. And on the other side of that, these two entities called capitalist and worker will not even be words anymore. There'll be another word called proletariat, and there will not be profits, right? Okay, my point is that there are, they, they have both, whether you agree with Marxist feminists or psychoanalytic feminists, the first or the second, they both share something. And what they share is that we can understand the problem and that everyone is a, everyone belongs to a family. Everyone belongs to a family. The problem is how are families organized psychically? And everyone is a subject of commodity exchange. The problem is how are profits distributed or that profits exist? So let's keep political economy, political economy, because everyone is a subject of political economy and everyone has a family and just radically undo what families look like today. And we'll undo Bank of America, the capital and everything else, right? But the slave, what, what Afro-pessimism says is that though there are two gestures there. One is the gesture of the description of the problem. The second is the gesture which answers Lenin's question, what is to be done? And it's that precise second gesture that Afro-pessimism cannot provide. You cannot provide a sentence of what is to be done for a being whose suffering actually sustains everyone else's life. You can you can you can prescribe a quite you can ask the question what is to be done for a being whose suffering um, is um, describes the woman's life but the but the white man is a beneficiary of that yeah we, we get done we we deal with white male patriarchy and, and and heteronormativity but if everyone everyone who suffers everyone who is who is colored, everyone who is poor, everyone who is rich, if everyone is psychically who they are, because at the end of the day, when everything is stripped from them, all their money, their culture, and everything else, they have the one sense of security to know I am not black, then you cannot on the other side write a sentence of what it means for black liberation, because black liberation involves the destruction of everyone else's capacity to exist in this framework. And, th and therefore, we're, we're on the brink of a whole new new epistemy. So true Afro pessimism, and I must tell you, Matt, that that second wave Afro pessimism is coming with Diana Leong's book and Sarah Maria Sorrentino's books and all these other books. Are, you know, this is this is old ass first wave uh, Afro pessimism. I hope to be on a I hope to be on a villa in Malta, not writing anything else. When so. <laughs> And, and don't ask me any questions either, you know, when second wave Afro pessimism hits the streets, okay? <laughs> <You know? laughs> or in Holland, where reefer is legal, you know, I, either either one, you know, but um, but these questions will be addressed more profoundly in, in the books that are coming out. I just think that, that you cannot, th th there's the N word, which is very important to this whole dynamic. And the N word has no transformative capacity. I know I'm understanding a lot of hip hop artists right now, uh, but unlike uh, words for gay people that are, are, are homophobic, words for Latinx people, which are racist, uh, words for Chinese and, and Asian people, which are racist, there's no way to capture for these subordinated groups, these subordinated groups have captured these words and turned them on their head to make them something different inside their own community. Or to, there's, there's no trend. This is the thing. The N word has no transformative capacity, which is, which is Afro pessimism's interrogation of basic semiotics. It is a word without a future. And it has to stay that way if all other words have transformative capacity, if all other people have transformative capacity. Therefore, if you imagine a new world where Black people are free, then you've, then you've moved from analysis into sentiment. Because a new world where Black people are free is a world where there are no Black and there are no humans. It's completely you know, different. So, so I think that Afro-pessimism is... Um, pessimistic, not about life, 
or about it's not it's not an emotional pessimism i'm glad you brought that it's a it's a pessimism of the intellect to quote from gramsci it's a pessimism of marxism's capacity to explain black suffering it's a pessimism of psychoanalytic uh feminism's capacity to explain black women's suffering it's a pessimism of the intellect but to get back to gramsci it's an optimism of the will because there is nothing more profound than the bang that happens when black people set it off. There's nothing like, there's nothing, there's nothing psychically like black revolt. And um, because it's, it's a revolt of a people who have nothing to salvage and nothing to lose. It's, there's no destination. That was a fantastic final answer to actually end on. I felt like it sort of, yeah, but it put an exclamation mark and an ellipses and any other punctuation mark you can think of at the end of your talk. So thank you so much, Dr. Wilderson. We very much appreciate it. And thank you to everybody for coming. Have a great day. Thank you. Day. Oh, and please, uh, Frank is actually speaking again next week, Wednesday um, on the topic of reparations. So please come um, for that as well. <laughs>